Well, good evening, everybody. This is Ken Cavula from the Mid Michigan chapter of Better Investing. I'm joined with my dear friend Mark Robertson from Manifest Investing. Mark's the CEO and president of that website. And together we're going to present a series of classes that's part of our successful investing uh, grand series. We've been doing these now since the beginning of the pandemic, and we were going to stop when the pandemic kind of slowed down, but uh, the, the requests have been coming in for us to continue. So if you want to come, we'll, we'll try to put them together for you. We've been focusing on beginners now. We did a series in January and another couple classes uh, uh, between January and now about for our novice and beginning investors. And we're going to continue to speak to our beginning investors tonight uh, until we get to our stock panel. And it's a no holds barred uh, discussion of stocks. That's class four uh, this evening or tomorrow evening. So this first class tonight is called Gaining Confidence. And Mark, if you'll go to the next slide, that, by the way, folks, is a picture. The background picture is that pictured rocks in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. I know that looks like the ocean, but that's Lake Superior. And uh, besides the taste of the water, uh, I think that the oceans and Lake Superior look pretty much the well, same when you're standing on the shorelines. If you twist my arm sometime, I'll tell you about kayaking on Lake Superior. And trust me, it was a lot like today's stock market. So... <laughs> So let's go to the next slide, Mark. Uh, we are doing an educational presentation. Here's the title of our program for tonight. I'm a director with the MidMichigan chapter, so is Mark, and I've already mentioned that he's the president of Manifest Investing. So let's learn to read a stock selection guide. This is an educational demonstration. We might hold the stocks or some of the stocks that we talk about this evening, and if we do, we'll try to let you know. If you'd like to come to our monthly program called The Roundtable, and if you're not already on the MidMichigan guest list, drop an email to nkavula1 at comcast.net. That's my wife, Natalie, and she'll guide you to uh, how you can add your name to our guest list, and then she'll send you a reminder once a month about our roundtable program. I'm not going to go into any great detail on that program except to say we, we've been following a portfolio right now that's been beating the market by four and a half to seven percent now over the last uh, 14 years and we're still at it we're still having a really great time and we think we provide some very very high class ideas for investing at our roundtable programs that's my real email address and mark's real email address and if you'd like copies of tonight's slides send the email to mark at manifest investing.com and either one of us would be glad to try to answer any questions that might arise from the classes let's go to the next slide if you would tonight we're going to learn to read a stock selection guide we are not going to attempt in this first class to tell you how to create a guide we're going to take you back to first grade where the first thing you learn to do before you learn to write before you learn to put words on paper and make a story, the first thing you learned to do was to recognize sight words and to put together a little bit of that knowledge and begin to read Dick and Jane if you're of my generation, okay? Uh, I really do believe that until you can read a stock selection guide, you're never going to be able to create one. Uh, the, the two things are, are in tandem with each other, but you have to read before you can create. What the guide says is profound but it's also pretty easily understood. And it all comes down to one word, reasonable. Is the guide that you're reading reasonable? And that's the question that we're gonna to try to answer as we read a couple of real SSGs coming from some of the model clubs that I'm involved with. Next slide, Mark. 
We'll be looking at a few companies tonight, and we're going to start with Microsoft. And here's the SSG Plus. That's the tool we're going to use. And here's the front page, the first tab, if you will, of the SSG Plus. I don't want you to read it from this slide. It's too small. But again, we're going to try to answer the question, is the SSG reasonable? Next slide, Mark. I've blown up the visual analysis, the graph of the company. And the first thing I'd like you to look at when you're looking at this piece of the first tab is circled. Give me a click mark if you would. And I'd like you to decide, first of all, is there growth in the most recent quarter? Uh, you obviously are looking at the lines. You're seeing them go up. They're reasonably straight and they're parallel to each other or reasonably so. And that's the model that as a beginner you need to look for. There are thousands and thousands of stocks, but there aren't as many stocks that are up straight and parallel. What that means when you see that is that you have consistency in sales growth, in profitability growth, and in earnings growth. And the first place that I want you to look as far as data is concerned is over what I have circled. And I want you to say to yourself, is there growth going on in the quarter? That's all I want you to look for. Is there growth? Are the percentage change values for sales and earnings positive? And in Microsoft's case, they had a wonderful last quarter. This is the fourth quarter of 23 that we're looking at. And their sales increased uh, by a huge amount for a large company and their earnings by even a huger amount. Next click mark, if you would. Beneath that growth projections, you see some numbers where somebody's been making estimates into the future. These estimates are not better investing estimates, folks. These estimates come from Morningstar. It says sales two-year estimate, and that's a Morningstar number. And then it says EPS long-term estimate, that's a five-year estimate into the future. Two years for sales, five years for earnings, and the data's coming from Morningstar. Please, I don't want to hear any of the novice people when I go to convention tell me that these are better investing numbers. They're not. <laughs> they belong to Morningstar. I also want you to look at the legend box, which is beneath where we were just looking at the analyst consensus. And if you click once again, Mark, Maybe I don't have circles on them. I'm sorry, back it up. You don't? Uh, if you look, I don't have circles on them, no. Okay. And if you look down there at the bottom, you'll notice that I've highlighted or I've clicked on and made them dark sales detailed estimates and EPS detailed estimates. Folks, those are also coming from Morningstar. Now, what's beautiful is when Morningstar gives us the data, we accept it gratefully. But when it doesn't give us the data, and unfortunately, for many of the companies in the BI database, there's not going to be this data available. When it's not there, it's not there, and we need to have alternate sources for looking at data. That's all we need to say as we read this. What's the most important thing? Up, straight, and parallel. Next slide, please. At the bottom of the first tab, you see the sales the sales numbers and the earnings numbers, the pre-tax profit numbers for the last 10 years. And I want you to zero in as you're reading, zero in on the last fiscal year. And I put a box around it, that 211.9 or 211,915. These are in millions. So that means Microsoft sold $211 billion worth of goods. For a large company, and this is a large company, the growth was exceptional. Notice the 10-year growth rate is about 12%. 
we should expect the growth rate for a very large company to be somewhere better than three up to maybe around seven, even eight. So when we find a large company growing at almost 12, we've found an exceptional company. That doesn't mean it's a buy, but it is an exceptional company. You can see the better investing rules down at the bottom of the slide there. A small company sells less than a billion. A large company sells more than 10 billion in the last fiscal year. And a medium-sized company somewhere between one and 10 billion. So focus on that and read it. Understand what it's telling you. Next slide. This section at the very bottom of the first tab is evaluating management. And it only changes once a year. When a fiscal year ends, we get brand new numbers and the oldest data falls off this chart and the newest data would replace the oldest data. So next year we'll see 2015 through 2024 on this particular graph. Uh, you have to understand that there are certain regulations or rules, and I hate to use the word rules because those rules become misquoted all the time, but there are certain things that you should look for. You don't know whether the profit is good or bad until you begin to compare the company to other companies in the same industry doing roughly the same thing. So that profit of 42% earning 42 cents on the dollar sounds pretty good, but we don't know if it's the best or not until we compare it to some of its competitors. Return on equity, however, has kind of a benchmark we can use. 20 is a good number to remember. And any kind of return on equity greater than 20 is a superb number. It's a fantastically good number. A good solid average number is somewhere in the high teens. And even returns on equity of 13, 14, 15 are considered solid. When those ROEs move into single digits, however, that might be talking about a company that's in trouble. We also like to see debt to capital under 33% for most companies, but there are huge exceptions to that rule. So when there are exceptions, when you do see debt that's higher than 33%, then we have an alternative on the tool. And as a reader of the SSG, you should learn where you can find the alternative. Next slide, please. What you do is you press uh, the ratios tab on your tool and up comes this screen. And at the bottom of the screen, what you do is you see the interest coverage. That's the number of times that the company can pay the interest on its debt from the cash on hand. And Microsoft has wonderful re interest uh, coverage, 46 times. It can pay its interest 46 times over. What's a good number? Anything in double digits or greater. What's a number that should worry you? Anything maybe around five or below. Five or below might mean that the company is having real, real trouble handling the debt that it's incurred uh, for the operation of the company. Next slide, please. Remember, we're just reading. And this chart in section three on the second tab of the tool, this chart is all historical and all fact. It all happened. Some of it happened yesterday, and some of it happened in the last quarter or the last year. There are certain things that you should look for when you're looking at the chart. And in my mind, one of the most important things you look for is, has the preparer crossed out any of the data? I don't like to see data crossed out of these things. I have people that really do not understand the meaning of the word outlier, and they just go willy-nilly crossing numbers out until they get something that they're comfortable with. I think that most of the time, all of the data should be included 
for your consideration. We haven't crossed anything out of the Microsoft data. And so I'd like you to look for certain things when you're looking at this chart. I think I want the next slide now, Mark. Okay, and Ken, I do have a question or I just wanted to point out, uh, you're not gonna go into it, but there is this option to switch a, to a 10 year backward looking history. I think that's an excellent uh, enhancement to the tool to be able to look at 10 years of PE ratios. Absolutely. Uh, I think I need one more click now. I'm looking more, for some animation. More. I'm looking for some animation. No, nope, back yeah, it up. I don't have any I'm, animation. Okay. I'm just not an animated right. guy, I guess. I, I know. <laughs> All right. Uh, what I want you to do, focus, uh, folks, is at the bottom of column D and E, you'll see the columns are averaged. And the average numbers are in heavy type, 33.8 uh, at the top, 22.5 at the bottom. If you add those two numbers together, and divide by two, you get that five-year average over on the left over there, 28.2. On the right, you get the current PE, that's as of the day before you're looking at it, 38.1. You see a closing price and it's dated up there on the top. Make sure your SSG that you're reading has a current price on it. If it doesn't have a current price, then the SSG might be telling you some very, very strange things versus what's actually happening. Of course, this is a little old because we had to prepare the presentation. You also also see a 52 week high and a 52 week low and you can characterize the fact that Microsoft is trading near the top of its 52 week range right now very important uh, check all those values just internalize them for the moment you're not preparing the stock selection guide you're just kind of accessing some of the data that was used to prepare it, and you should know where it exists. Next slide, Mark. PE is a way to compare stock valuations. I hear people tell me that NVIDIA is a really expensive stock because it's trading at 800 and some odd dollars a share. That's not why PE, that's not why NVIDIA might be expensive. NVIDIA might be expensive if it carries a PE of 45 or 50 or 55. PE will help us compare shares of stock, but PE is not always something that you can use. It's not an infallible comparer of stock to stock. Dollars per share is definitely not a way to compare stock to stock, but PE sometimes can be a good way to compare how the market values a particular stock. In general, a higher PE means the market is giving the stock a higher value than a stock that has a lower PE. When you multiply a PE times a corresponding E or earnings value, you get a price. And that's the key to the arithmetic on the SSG. We're going to show you that in just a moment as you read through it. Next slide. We're gonna set a growth rate for earnings. The person that prepared the SSG set a 13% growth rate for this company. And this, by the way, this particular SSG is coming from one of the clubs that I belong to. So that 13% was a real number that the club thought was realistic, okay? Our time frame for the growth is five years. So what we'll do, is we'll grow the trailing 12 months earnings, the TTM, and I've circled where you find it on that chart. We'll grow the trailing 12 months, the last four quarters earnings by 13% a year for five years. Now you can all get out your calculators and do the calculation, but I will assure you that I've done it 15 times and it gets you $20.38. I'm, che I'm checking you. We, 
you're checking me. Okay. <laughs> That's what we might expect the earnings to be in a five-year period, five years from today. It's a reasonable expectation, and the 13% growth rate is reasonable. Next slide. It checks, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Assuming the forecast average high PE will stay roughly the same, right now, the last five years, it averaged 33.8. So we're going to assume that it stays around 33 going forward. We'll use that formula we just learned. In fact, the formulas on the second tab of the SSG plus. Next slide, Mark. And there it is, a PE value times an earnings value, giving us a price. In this case, it was high PE, estimated high earnings, giving us forecast high price. Notice that the person that prepared the stock selection guide chose not to use the 33.8 or the 33. They chose to use 30. And if you don't understand that choice, here's a great time for you to ask a question of the person that prepared it. Obviously, the preparer feels that the PE values are going to recede a little bit. They're going to slow down a little bit into the future. I think it's a reasonable thing to assume. Next slide. If we don't have any growth at all, that's the worst case scenario for a growth company. And that's the kind of company we're studying. And so what I'm saying is, if that trading 12 months earnings number of $11.06 doesn't grow at all for five years, that'll be worst case. That'll be low price scenario. So click again, Mark. We're going to use that same formula again. In letter A up there, there is a PE times an earnings, and it's giving us a price. In this case, they came very close to the five-year low average and chose 22.5. They used the average from the last five years and assumed that that low PE would stay at the same place. There's that $11.06, no change in earnings over a five-year period, and that gives us a low price, okay? As a beginner, I urge you to choose choice A. And if, as you read the SSG, the preparer did not choose choice A, then you might want to ask why. And then you want to listen carefully to the response. Next slide. Well, we set a high price, we set a low price, and we know the current price. It's on a bar now, a, one, a nice tall bar, and the bar is divided into four pieces, the one on the left. The red top quarter is the sell zone. The bottom green quarter is the buy zone. And the middle half, the middle two quarters, is the hold zone. Notice the current price right smack in the dip middle. It's about a one-to-one -one upside downside risk to reward ratio. Why? Because the upper distance is almost exactly equal to the distance to the bottom. In fact, if you do the calculation, the upside downside ends up being 1.1, almost exactly 1. And this is a solid hold at the moment. Internalize that. You're reading. You're not preparing. Next slide. Our method talks about upside, downside, risk to reward. And you should understand that we're not talking about odds. 
we're just talking about the number of chances you have of being above rather than below the line that separates by from the entire rest of the bar. The buy zone is the bottom quarter, and since we're disciplined investors, we make sure that we actually get into the buy zone as a beginner before we buy. Next slide. We're still reading, and section five is the reason we do an SSG. Look at the bottom down there. It's telling us what we might end up with in return, somewhere between six and almost 9%. That 6% is calculated using that average PE <clears throat> that we looked at back in the, the grid, the, the data, the historical data. And that 8.7% is calculated using the high PE that was chosen, that was that 30. Notice that both of these returns include a return from the dividend. And if the stock pays a dividend, that dividend is always included in the return. We would hope that a lot more of the appreciation comes from the stock price growing than from the dividend itself. Many times, however, with very, very large companies, you will find the dividend yield coming very close to the amount of appreciation that you're going to get in the stock price itself. Where does that appreciation come from? Well, let's click again, Mark. You want to look back in that data section in column G, and you want to see how much of the profit the company gives back to the shareholders in the form of a dividend. Notice the percentage has stayed pretty close to somewhere in the high 20s or low 30s. And I think a reasonable number would be anything from about 27 to 32. There is no correct answer. There's only reasonable answers. And again, you're reading and you're asking yourself the question, is the payout that they set in section five reasonable? I think that 28 is extremely reasonable for the payout based on the numbers I see in column G. Next slide. Dividend is part of the total appreciation. And while the return is reasonable, this 6 to almost 9%, it's reasonable for a large company. The SSG is saying in good, simple English, wait until you have a better, and by better, I mean lower stock price, because then you'll have a better return. Wait, be patient as an investor. Don't buy now, wait. And there will be a time, and a lot of companies within a year cycle between buy and hold, buy and hold quite regularly. There might be a time within the next year when Microsoft will cycle into the buy zone. That's the time you buy it, not now. Tab, next slide. Let's read another SSG, and let's try to do it a little quicker. And let's try to bring in some other data if we can. Next slide. Here's a value line sheet. It's a trusted source. It's easily found, accessible. And therefore, I would suggest that if your company has a value line sheet, and many, many companies do, if it has a value line sheet, I would, I would ask you to get a hold of it for your company. And then only check four places besides the commentary. And the commentary is kind of in the bottom middle down there. There's five or six paragraphs of written commentary, which, of course, you should read as you're reading the SSG. But the four places as a reader that I want you to access are the long-term returns I marked it with a one and put a box around it and then kind of blew it up on the right there. 
Value Line thinks this stock over the next three to five years, no up a box, Mark. Dope, oh, sorry. Yeah. Value Line thinks in the next three to five years that the uh, appreciation for the stock should be somewhere between 8 and 20%. That's what you're looking for when this stock is going to really be something that's attractive, okay? I want you to check number two. I put a two on it on the sheet, boxed it in, and then blew it up over on the right. That's the second box down. Value Line gives you some reasonable numbers for growth. These are not the answers. These are not the correct numbers because there aren't correct numbers. There's only a whole slew of different opinions coming from many, many different sources. The sales number for Value Line, they think sales might grow at 15%. They think earnings might grow at 18%. That's considerably more robust than the numbers our preparer chose. Just kind of keep that in mind. Number three, I put a number on it and boxed it in. It's down in the bottom right-hand corner. And make sure that you're reading a, a value line that's reasonably up to date. This is probably a value line that's the most recent one on five below that we could find. A Until new one week. will come out. A new one will come out in three months. I was just going to say that. <laughs> and that would be sometime next week, okay? And the fourth place I want you to look is up there at the very top. I want you to check the price at the time that the report was printed. If that price is way different than the current price, then those projections in box one and box two might be low. Again, if that price is way higher than the price that you see today that it's trading at, then those projections might be low and vice versa would be true. If that price on the report is way lower, then the projections might be a little bit high. Keep that in mind, especially for an older report. And this is about as old as a report can get before it refreshes itself every quarter, every three months. Next slide. Well, look at this graph, up, straight, and parallel, especially if I kind of squint during the pandemic. Remember, this is a retailer, five below. You're all familiar with the company, and they closed all their stores in 2020. You would expect earnings to do exactly what they did. And then they began to reopen stores, and everybody rushed to buy things. And you would expect the earnings to do what they did there. And then you'll notice in 22 and 23, the earnings sort of went back to the former trend that they were on before the pandemic. Again, look at the most recent quarter. There's growth. And you know, now would be a great time to compare that growth to your expectations. Do you see the expectations down here when they forecast sales growth at 13%? and earnings growth at 14%. I would love for you to always characterize this in English, not in numbers. Because if you characterize in English, you have a better time of remembering it. In English, I would say, five below beat expectations in the last quarter. Simple English sentence that says it all. Next slide. Again, make sure that you have some of these other things turned on and make sure, folks, that you're projecting from the most recent quarter up there. Uh, so many times when somebody brings me an SSG and says, my numbers are the same as yours, but none of my analysis matches, it's because they're projecting from a different starting point. If you start the race somewhere else, you finish the race somewhere else. We're all going to start the race at the most recent quarter, especially as a novice investor. Next slide. Again, these numbers only change once a year, and you can't figure out if it's good or not on the profit until you compare it to other retailers. Return on equity, a good number. 20 plus is excellent, superb. 
High teens is great. Mid to low teens is, is average or good. And single digits might be a problem. And debt, we would like debt to go under 33%. If you see it higher, like you do on this retailer, then click the ratios tab. Next slide. And the ratios tab, I'm going down to interest coverage, shows in 2022 and 2023 little lines, little three dot lines. What's that mean? Well, the rules changed a while ago, and companies now have to include lease expenses in their long-term debt. This little three-line symbol here means that this company has no debt other than leases. So those debt numbers in the SSG that we just looked at are only talking about lease expenses. There is no traditional long-term borrowed debt for this company, and that's what the three little dots mean. Next slide. Check the current price, check the five-year averages, check the high and low PEs, make sure that the low price is coming from choice A, and check out the upside-downside ratio. Aha, this one says buy. Next slide. Again, the most important part of the SSG. Look at the summary. A buy, a 3.9 to 1 upside-downside ratio, Total return, about 13%. Average return, about 11%. Is that good enough for a medium-sized company, which this is? Well, yes, I think so. I think it's a good return for a medium-sized company. And therefore, I might, if this fits into our portfolio, I might even vote for this one if the preparer suggests that we buy this stock or buy more of this stock. Everything seems to be fitting together pretty nicely for this five below stock. Next slide. Listen, read, rinse, repeat. One more time, only faster again. Medpace, I want you to be able to read in two or three minutes. So there's where you check on value line. I've circled them again for you to, to reference. Next slide. Up straight and parallel. The dots are turned on down in the legend. The company exceeded our expectations. And the Morning Star estimates going forward are there for the use, for our use. Sales two-year growth, 16 and a half. Earnings five-year growth, about 14%. Next slide. Are you noticing that there's a wide variation in analyst projections? This really bothers a lot of beginners. It bothers beginners in the classes uh, that I teach, and it bothers them in the clubs that I belong to. Just expect that to happen. Databases screen and look at data from different sources, and they have different opinions. They might be diametrically opposed to each other. Your job is to collect as much data and to read as much of that data as you can so that you're informed and you can answer the question, is the number that was finally chosen reasonable? I think the numbers that have been used in this SSG for five below are very reasonable. The 1414 seems to fit right with the Morningstar numbers. And I'll tell you, they fit very well with the value line numbers as well. Next slide. Here's management. Remember, this doesn't change except once a year. I don't know if this is good profit for a retailer until I check it against profit from other retailers. I might even do that. Return on equity, oh wow, superb, especially in the last couple of years. 
debt to capital, well, that's really pretty nice. This is not a retailer, by the way. This is MedPace. And MedPace is a company that helps other companies move through FDA drug trials and medical device trials. It helps them follow the rules, set up the testing, and do all the minutia that has to be done to make a successful run at getting your drug or your medical device approved. Value Line will tell you that in a little blurb, so will Better Investing. And again, there's an analyst analysis for MedPace. Make sure you read it if you're reading this SSG. Next slide. I'm looking way down here and I see a button that we haven't even talked about. I showed you what the button does. So let's click that button. And here's where you see those bar graphs. You won't see them on the tool, but if you want the bar graphs, because they're really easy for a beginner to understand, if you want them, tell the preparer to put them in the presentation. They figured out about 600 plus as a top price, about 175 as a bottom price. The current price just under 400 bucks. Again, right smack dab in the middle of the range. MedPace is not a buy today, but it's a certainly an interesting, well financed, well put together small company. Next slide. Here's that last section. Right now, MedPace is overvalued. The forward possibilities are only 4% to maybe just under 10% return. And for a small company, I would really expect a lot more return than 4 to 10%. I might expect as much as maybe 12 to 20% for a small company, and I'm not going to get it at this price. I'm only seeing a one-to-one -one upside downside, and therefore, I'm getting a good solid hold. Next slide. Returns, quality, profitability, growth. I'm going to turn the. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to try to talk first of all. <laughs> I'm going to turn the presentation over to my buddy now, and he's going to take you on a a tour of Augusta National or something <laughs> similar. All right. Well, yeah, this is Amen Corner, I think. Um, certainly in keeping with the theme over the next few days as they hold the Masters down there in Georgia. And uh, we did use this slide a few years ago just to emphasize some of the key points of any study. Ken has been talking about these for the last few minutes. Uh, establish an understanding of the growth, the profitability of the company. Uh, basically, those combined to form some perception of the quality of a company. You already have an intuitive perceptional quality of many companies, your Johnson & Johnsons, your Aflacs, some of the Lockheed Martins out there, companies like that, you have some perceptions. And then as Ken has shown, pay attention to the return potential, the return forecasts. So at this point in the program, we're actually handing off from a calculus teacher to an engineer. So you're in great hands, everybody. Anybody out there that <laughs> You know, I, I like to, to think back to some of the early investment club visits I made in Chicago and, you know, walking into a room full of people who basically thought that the stock selection guide looked like this. And I, I can sympathize with that. I really can. I mean, some people are better with the pictures, the upstraight and parallels. Some people just love to crunch numbers. Some of you people on the broadcast tonight are just, you're sick because you enjoy this stuff. But one of the things that we like to do, with, especially with beginners, is take a step back, take a deep breath, because it really is not this complicated. They try to make it this complicated on CNBC every day. Uh, you don't have to do that here. Here's what we talk about. This is a, a very old slide that we have used probably dozens of times. And again, we're not all pretending to be the next Warren Buffett, but believe it or not, we have a bunch of individuals and a bunch of investment clubs who have comparable performance to Mr. Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway over time. And the reason we can say that is we know they've owned companies like Home Depot and a 
a variety of others where the up straight and parallel definitely kicks in. So what I'm going to take us through is just kind of a executive summary of some of this stuff and uh, just, just kind of reinforce some of the points that Ken made. Anytime you're doing a, a study of a company, considering it for purchase, you really want to do this exercise. Take a deep breath, close your eyes. If you like cherry Coke, take a sip. But think about, you're literally thinking about what this company might look like in five years. If they sell candy bars like Hershey, what's the, what's the probability that uh, we will continue to consume chocolate over the next five years? Companies like McDonald's, you can, again, you can have some expectation of what it might look like five years from now. What will it be worth under those conditions? And that's what the stock selection guide does. This is that same picture as the big blackboard with all that stuff on it, only as, boy, as Ken said, convert it to words and make it make sense. And Ken, I found it interesting that we used the word reasonable here twice, actually three times on this slide years ago. Uh, it's reasonable to expect this company to deliver a growth rate, filling in that first block, while maintaining a certain level of profitability and filling this one in. Make reasonable assumptions. When it does, we might pay this amount of a PE or a multiple that's deemed to be reasonable for the company over the long term. So again, you see reasonable, reasonable. So I have been asked a number of times if I would accept this as a stock selection guide you know, by club partners, I would. If you could basically defend those three fill in the blank moments with uh, evidence and understanding, you know, using the guide, using stuff that you discovered during your study, I definitely would because those three blanks filled in actually deliver that return forecast as demonstrated by the guides that you've seen on display. So again, the whole objective is to, to give you that long-term return forecast as shown here, so that you can make a decision about buying or selling or holding a particular position. All right, so back to the SSG on the wall, there it is. I mean, literally, if somebody handed that in to me at a club meeting, I would accept that if they filled in the blanks and then they could basically defend and discuss the rationale behind those. And if it was reasonable, let's go for it. I found this one to be interesting. We, this actually goes back to a presentation we had made on Stryker uh, back about 10 years ago. And Ken, I want you to know, I did not go hunting for what you're about to see. This was the first company that I chose, uh, somewhat at random, only because Stryker is a company that is near and dear to our hearts. Many of us in our demographic uh, are very closely connected to this company. But here was a study back then about 10 years ago that suggested that Stryker could grow at about seven and a half percent, okay? This is what has actually happened. This is the 10 years later. You can see that's that value line date that Ken said to watch out for. I want you to notice that number right there. It actually came in at seven and a half percent. That's actual rate for the last 10 years. And I didn't, I didn't pick this out. This is the first one I picked and it matched perfectly. And they're giving you that estimate, as Ken pointed out, of seven or eight and a half percent going forward. Here's what it looks like on the picture. Looking at it over time, you could make a case for anywhere in that eight percent ish range, plus or minus. And uh, that's the type of characterization you want to have. So, again, we predicted seven and a half on that study 10 years ago, came in at seven and a half. That should give everybody here a little bit more confidence. It doesn't always happen that way. Generally, if it doesn't, uh, it can be kind of an ugly situation for the company. Here's another thing that I like to point out that's just an, a little bit of an intangible, but it's not so intangible. Uh, as you're studying a company, many of us hold shares in Costco wholesale. And what you're looking at on the, at the bottom there is just, um, I don't think that this is available as one of the choices on the SSG Plus. Maybe in the future it will be. Uh, because for a retailer, you want to keep track of, keeping, th keeping track of, well, how do they sell? And the amount that they sell is related. It's a function of how many stores they've got out there. So you're looking at the history and the projections. It's history up to here, right? And it's projections out here. You want to make sure that, that uh, the, the continuation of opening store locations, building new stores and opening them up, 
continues on that long-term trend line, which checks in at about 4% growth for the company. Because when they stop doing that, and that's why these guys are up here, you could actually go back and look at the collapse of Toys R Us. They stopped opening new locations. They began closing stores. They actually had a change in management. And you could see it actually unravel if you're doing as you were doing stock studies back during that time frame. So again, for a retailer, think about how they sell. You know, a restaurant can only expand so much geographically and they will eventually reach a saturation. And that's why you want to have some idea about, you know, when that is beginning to happen as you study the company. So again, here's the, the aspect of imagining. You want to imagine what that company looks like going forward. Building that return forecast, up straight and parallel matters. And uh, again, uh, that whole process, if you fill in those three blanks, basically gives you this projected annual return, which is how you measure your interest in the company. Here's another point that I wanted to make. Um, this is one that you just want to be aware of as you're, as you're doing your studies. Uh, we had done a bit of a study on Church and Dwight, uh, the baking soda company, but they also make a whole bunch of other stuff. This is actually going back five or six years. And we were basically questioning the times when we would see the value line expectations out on the far right for their three to five year forecasts would always seem to be perhaps unreasonably high. And again, we're asking that question as we sit here, you know, what's reasonable? Well, one of the things we want to notice is that for a company like this, uh, it is fairly natural as the company matures to have a higher percent net margin over time. And just something you want to be aware of, that's what we mean by scalability. It means as you sell more, you're basically making a higher level of profitability. So just be aware that that is a business model uh, characteristic that happens for many, many companies. The more, the better, the more scalable, the higher the profit margins can go. So you're looking at a very long treatment of Church and Dwight going back. That's a 20 year stock selection guide or a visual analysis. And uh, here's what we basically found. And this is something that I think you, you want to be careful with as you're doing your study and, and asking that reasonable question. Um, some people, when they do the stock selection guide, will use, if they're using the preferred procedure, and by the way, you, we use the preferred procedure for every single company at Manifest Investing. Uh, the preferred procedure is basically an income statement model of the company. And by the way, it was called the preferred procedure because George Nicholson, the founder of NEIC, preferred it. He preferred to look at it that way. So as you as you ask for the profitability input and expectations, some people will use the trailing five years. Uh, it actually shows up in section 2A of the stock selection guide. You want to be careful with that number because in this type of a situation that you see here, uh, what you're looking at here, the reds are the actual results over time. The the purple or bluish, depending on your screen, bars are what would have been projected based on the trailing five years at that time. So again, this would have been the number in 2004 done on a stock selection guide. This is what actually happened up here. This is not a trivial thing. You can see that you're basically talking about a 40% error between the two bars. So you wanna have a handle on this. You wanna think about how is that profitability expected to track over time you might want to study other companies in the industry that are of comparable maturity and that sort of thing. So get a feel for the industry. You know, is it a company that has fairly constant level margins or is this possible for the type of business that we're talking about? And uh, this really came up in a, in a high level of detail during our discussions of Coca-Cola uh, several years ago, working with Steve Sanborn, one of the senior analysts at Value Line. And you, you basically couldn't get to a point where Coca-Cola seemed attractive if you didn't recognize what they were doing with their profitability over time. So you wanna think about the nature of the company, the nature of the industry, and you wanna you want to start thinking about this life cycle. Now, I know this is a class for beginners, but this is an important concept uh, in terms of understanding the type of reasonable expectations 
you can make for the company? Is it a mature Hershey's or is it a, a startup company like Portillo's hot dogs? There you go, Ken. I got Portillo's into the discussion. I didn't. Uh, I knew you would, Mark. I, I knew I you did, would. Did <laughs> not, I did not know I was going to do that until just now. So I missed my chance with that. So again, what we, we recommend that you begin framing as you go through your, your, uh, references and your investment research sources is understand these two characteristics. The one at the bottom is the one you're most familiar with. That is the one that you calculate. Basically, a net margin is your earnings divided by your total sales or revenues. And you can see this is a company that has trucked along at from approximately 10% and uh, seems to have kind of stagnated a little bit in that 12 to 14% range. For whatever reason, value line has a number a little bit higher out on the far right. A little higher up the income statement, you're talking about operating expenses over sales, the operating margin. And this can be an important thing to understand as you compare other companies in an industry. And anytime this happens, because by the way, these are actual numbers. That cap down there, that dip down, uh, there are things going on here that you want to understand. And uh, a lot of times you will have as much as a year, year and a half, in some cases, even two years to take action on this. This is a, a potentially dangerous situation for an investor. If you're holding the company, you want to understand, well, why did they take that hit? Uh, you know, come to an understanding of, you know, did it come to, it was it based on a, a temporary increase in raw material costs? Figure out why that is happening and why is it expected to continue to be happening? Because the profitability of this particular company is impact. I do not know the answer, but I know that they, for whatever reason, are projecting them to go back to where they were and then some. So I want to understand what they might see. So I think that's an interesting thing to look at. As far as life cycle, this is a little bit heavy at this point in the program, but we're still going to... Uh, pointed out, you want to understand where your company is in, in its life cycle. And uh, again, Ken mentioned that uh, PE ratios can be a little bit elusive, a little bit difficult to understand. Most of the investing that we do is in this core area where PE ratios work. PE ratios do not work when there is no E. Um, every once in a while, just to make sure Ken is paying attention, I'll send him a stock selection guide that doesn't have any earnings on it. Uh, he generally loses consci consciousness and then yells at me. Um, that just simply means I'm looking at a company that's over here somewhere. He he calls it the price to hope ratio when you're in this mode. But the fact of the matter is, if you can find a promising company that is coming through startup and uh, beginning to emerge and take off, it can be a very profitable situation to get into. You just don't want to get in too early and you want to be aware of what some of the dangers are. So the, the, the zero point, call it ground zero for a company, is where the earnings, this line down here, actually goes through and breaks zero and goes positive. So if you can invest in a company that is going to take off and, and go on this trajectory, you can do pretty well. Otherwise, you basically wait that five or 10 year period and that, again, that's plus or minus, let it get more established so that it's a more mature company Maybe you're more comfortable investing in four versus early three. The other thing that you can do as you're monitoring companies, and again, this is not for novices, but as, as a novice or a beginner, just note the term cash flow and uh, explore it, read stuff about it. The, the cash flow breaks through zero more earlier than the earnings do. So you actually get a little bit of advance warning and uh, a chance to get in there. But again, for a, for a beginner or a novice, we really do recommend that you basically stick out here in this more up straight and parallel, or as we also call it, core. Fair enough? Anything you want to add to that, Ken, or are you okay with that? I'm very okay with what you said, Mark. Yeah. Okay, just a couple other examples. This is not fiction, guys. I mean, you, you, we had a company, company, Under Armour, that grew at an exorbitant rate for a number of years, and they hit the brakes. So you want to be aware of this stuff and try to understand what, what in the world would have been the causes, because I want you to notice how uh, incredibly destructive 
it was to the price. When that company hit the brakes on their visual analysis, I want you to notice where the price went and it has not yet recovered. So that's why you wanna be paying attention to your visual analysis and monitoring for weakness. Here's another story, it's just the opposite. Ken's already been talking about this one. Um, wow, this is Microsoft going back to the 1980s. You see a dramatic, in, uh, as the windows came out and all the great stuff they were doing, they actually did hit quite a lull here. So they basically went fairly flat for a while and then they did the software as a service and all the data center stuff and other stuff that they're doing. This is a company that has reinvented itself. In other words, this company, let's say Microsoft were headed for, you know, could they be headed for decline? They reinvented themselves and uh, basically took off on a whole new growth trajectory. So again, something to be aware of can certainly map it with cash flow. Here's another company just to illustrate the point of, uh, I'm trying to understand this company a little bit better. And you know, how do we decide where it is on that life cycle curve? Again, you pull up the value line data, you pull up your charts. This is where they had their breakthrough moment. Back in 2018, they actually began to go positive on the cash flow. And then in 2019, you can see that earnings actually hit a positive value for the first time. So for service now, this is the zero point. This is ground zero for the company. And you can see that leading into it, these guys have been consistent with respect to sales or revenues, and they have continued to be uh, quite consistent and uh, just an interesting way. But again, the demonstration here is how do you decide what, what uh, ground zero is for a company like this? And this is where you find it, where the company turns positive in earnings. And again, as a beginner or a novice, you're not going to want to do too much of this until you begin to get a feel for uh, you know, what can happen. Because for one thing, if this company dips back below zero somewhere along here, if the earnings dip down here, it's going to get punished when it comes to the stock price. So just be aware of that. All right, so let's talk a little bit about PE ratios. There are companies where people try to attach PE ratios to them. Uh, before they should, going back to this graphic here, uh, there's no place for a PE ratio along here. You can start to use a PE ratio sometime in that stage of the company's growth. And um, this is just one of the greater abuses that we see of that single piece of information, part of the puzzle known as the PE ratio. And yes, that's Inigo Montoya basically saying, be careful with that. I have seen uh, stock presentations get cratered by somebody saying, well, Amazon's PE is 124. Yeah, it's high, but it's also not even a PE yet. So uh, that translates historically into a never use a PE ratio greater than 30. Uh, I would strike the word never and just simply say, understand what it is, understand where it is in its life cycle. I can point to companies like Paychex, um, that had a PE ratio between 40 and 50 for 20 or 30 years. Now, it has come down since then, but I can also point to the reality. In fact, I wrote an article for Better Investing back in this time frame, which basically made the point that if you limited the, the maximum PE on the company to 30 during that time frame, Microsoft was never in the buy zone, which would have been a mistake. It would have been a mistake. It was a mistake that some people made. So just be careful with how you uh, use one piece of information to basically crater a stock study. So what has the PE ratio been for Microsoft over time? You can see that it's actually pushing up towards 40 right now, but going back over that long-term track record, you can see that it has moved around. Notice that during that period when they seem to be working on reinventing themselves and they were basically flatlining a little bit, the PE ratio did come down into the teens and low 20s. But since they've been back on that, again, software as a service model in combination with the data center stuff, the PE ratio has been re restored with the rejuvenated company up into the 30s. So again, this chart, if you're trying to understand uh, a company, go back, 
uh, do that 10 year expansion to go back and look at what the previous 10 years have looked at looked like and you can go to a number of sites and look at a longer term pe chart so with that let's see just uh again capturing this notion of uh, filling in those three boxes and that does complete and make for a reasonable stock study. All right, Ken, I think we're on time. We're right on time, Mark, and I'm very pleased with that. Uh, folks, these are our real email addresses. Again, if you'd like copies of the slides, uh, send a note to Mark. If you have questions, uh, either one of us would be glad to try to answer any questions you might have. And tomorrow on the YouTube channel, you will see these presentations posted. And uh, we urge you to go there and take a look at them if you want to review anything from them or if you want to see them in their entirety. Thanks a lot for coming this evening. Our next presentation will be at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. And my wife has asked me to remind everyone that if you're looking frantically for your confirmation for the second class, we are finding that GoToMeeting is being a little bit uh, uncooperative in sending you emails that sometimes don't end up in your spam folder. So if you're missing a confirmation before you frantically call my wife, why not check out your spam folder? More often than not, we're finding the confirmations are sitting there, especially if you registered very quickly for all four of the classes all at once. So with that being said, thank you so much for being in our audience tonight. Thank you so much for coming. And Mark, as usual, a great big thank you for the MidMichigan chapter and the members of MidMichigan for all that you do for us. Thanks so much, buddy. You're most welcome. We'll be back on in a few minutes for the next session. Take care, everybody.